to look um, on the normal yep. YouTube studio to find the link to the live stream. Yep. Let, let me do that. Sure. I must say that we're getting much more expert at this stuff now. Yeah. It's amazing what a couple of weeks of practice will do. So I look on content live. Yep. And it'll and be the top link there now. Top link. I just um, get shareable link. That's what I want, right? Yep. Let me update the, what, the live stream page. I know there's a way to define an event, you know, in uh, YouTube, there's a way to somehow define an event and then. We will figure that out in the future. <laughs> this is working fine this way. Yep. Um, in any case, uh, well, the uh, website's being up. We are recording and live on YouTube again. Welcome again to uh, Tuesday. Um, yeah, and the plan for today, um, so the first meeting slot is uh, Jennifer Hassler and myself. That's sort of an update from the um, Analog Neuromorphic Tools group. Um, the first part of that is supposed to be a discussion on um, the work that's been happening so far with uh, coming up, um, sorry, with a, this Skywater project where, we're, where people are actually saying, okay, no, let's actually go ahead and since there are these free projects that can let people have chips manufactured, let's actually put together a longer term project to design exactly what we want. Um, and so an update on that would be great, except I do not see Jennifer here right now. I know she was having a bunch of travel things going on. Um, so the other aspect that I would like to talk about is one thing that we're thinking both for that chip and also was coming up in a lot of the other projects uh, here at Telluride is some questions about online learning. Oh, there's Jennifer. Um, so in, after Jennifer talks about the um, Skywater stuff, um, the second part, um, I wanna bring together some of the general tips that I've been discovering and playing with over uh, dealing with online learning, especially with the sort of the really minimal approach to online learning that I've been advocating about, look, just use Delta rule. There's lots of things you can do with that but there's a lot of subtleties that can be a surprise to people who are used to neural networks. If you're used to dealing with neural networks where you're doing backprop to optimize everything, then you're letting backprop deal with a whole bunch of details that you don't have to deal with. Um, but if you're, if, if you're looking at online learning and you're not looking to support backprop on your chip, which most people aren't, um, then I think those are things that, that a lot of us, um, um, it could be useful to, raise awareness of some of these issues. So that's what I, I wanna talk about in the second part. Um, that's everything I just talked about. That's the first hour. After the first hour, just to uh, get the overall schedule clear, um, there is definitely a talk after the first hour and I've forgotten completely what it is. I am looking at the schedule. Anyone remember offhand? Um, Yes, yeah, so, so there's some lectures from the uh, NMMC, the NMC group, um, uh, Alessio Franke and Fred Brockard. Um, so that will be happening. Uh, what is that on? On universal perturbation paths in neural circuits and dynamic clamp synapses in neuromorphic neural interfaces. So that'll be happening in the second hour. So we shall see how that all goes. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to? Uh, um start us off for our session or you're muted yeah hi yeah no happy to start to have the conversation on on some of the some of the various groups i think part of this is going to be an update of where we are uh, or a lot we've been having i, I mean I'd say the last two weeks we, we've been doing a tremendous amount of talking about both um FPA structures. We've been talking a lot about um, more about how do we, you know, kind of use and use some of these remote systems. We've been talking about, um, you know, a whole range of stuff with all the with Nango. We've been talking about different interactions of tools and so forth, which has been great. I think there's been a huge amount of interest on, you know, actually, you know, applying this towards some of the Skywater material. This has been a discussion from the very beginning of the workshop. 
And so we've actually spent a little bit of time trying to dig into some of those questions. Uh, and then trying to figure out people like, hey, we should try to build something by one means or another. Um, you know, we were already kind of figuring, well, at least we could get into, onto one of the runs that's coming up. And I think a number of people are, are getting serious about wanting to build something. I think then the question starts becoming, okay, practically, how do we, two things, how do we start building stuff? And then how do we start um, moving, how do we move forward on this? Uh, you know, how do we start getting people up to speed on this? And I think we've been getting lots of people contributing a lot of pieces um, on practical details of how to start coming up to speed on it. Um, and then, but a lot of it now becomes, well, what do we want to start building? And, and there's been a couple different um, threads along that. I mean, from my perspective, I, and so multiple discussions about a couple of these. Um, personally, it'd be fun to do all, all of them if we have lots of people, you know, lots of hands to do it. Um, that'll be cool. Uh, it's been relevant for me digging into all this because I probably had my head buried in a lot of the Skywater 130 stuff for um, many, many weeks. I'll just go with that. I'm trying to finish things for a particular run. Um, and uh, actually, we talked a little bit about some of the conversations around standard cells and synthesis and so forth at, at that point. Um, so I that, that'll be one thing to eventually once I, once I get some, come up for air on that, uh, can uh, make, some of, make some of those tools available and make virtual, because I tend to like to build virtual machines with this stuff. So it seems like there's a couple of things that have been, that have been in, in the conversation. Um, we have talked, there's been discussions about um, taking some of the ideas that, that Terry Stewart has looked at uh, from the Nengo side in terms of Having some sort of general linear dynamics in front of a in front of a classifier structure, whether it be, you know, more um, neuron neural two layer neural network or a VMM winner take all one layer network kind of um, solver, to actually do that for other interesting sort of uh, sort of command word kind of things. People have talked about that as a conversation. I think that's an interesting, really interesting one. That gets you into you know where do you get from the you know gets from um, you know, basically microphone all the way through because that's, you know, that's the right way to do solutions, right? You don't just do a piece, you do a whole part of it. Um, so that would work. There's been discussions about um, doing, and I think, you know, Andreas has brought this up, but I think a couple of different places of doing a, um, doing a retina type structure. Um, the, at 130 nanometer, you certainly have a, a decent size. You can do a little, you can do an interesting starting structure with that, which would be kind of fun to do. Um, integrates potentially some floating gate structures in there because they're just, you know, they're cool. Uh, it really allows you to get rid of some of the, the mismatch and allows you to get some programmability in it. That would be really cool. So that looks like a really good sort of thing. And then there's been a third conversation of, well, what would happen if we just build more sort of a generic neuron plus synapses kind of device, um, which has, you know, a couple of core bi biological neuron type structures in it. Um, I sometimes just call it a, you know, call it a neuron zoo, but actually, you know, such that it has a realistic synapses, which I, I would argue would be like floating gate based channel model structures, uh, and those will work. And that's been kind of the perspective we've been looking at. And I personally think any and all of those are cool. Um, I, 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 that might have been in order, but I think any or all of those are really cool. And um, think what we're just now doing is trying to get a sense of who wants to kind of jump into each of these questions. And um, my guess is the one will get, the ones will get done based on who does what, you know, on enthusiasm on this. Cause, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm pretty enthusiastic at how we're looking at these questions at this point. Um, and I think that's kind of coming to, coming to a point, but I'll, let me pause for a second. And if there are people who I've been in these conversations, want to say something otherwise, please tell me. Um, I think there's some really neat things. That, I mean, the one thing I will say is that any of these systems, you definitely want to be end to end on the system. You also want to make sure that whatever interfaces you have to your devices is fairly um, usable uh, to, from a computing standpoint. So SPI would be nice if you're connecting to a computer what, or, or a, some other form. So again, it's thinking about the overall system will also be very, very important to get that efficient. Um, I'm sure all the more senior people who've done neuromorphic design are going, well, of course that's obvious, but okay, fine. It should just be said. 
I think one thing that I will add on there is I really like that all of the designs you've talked about are all things that we've got sort of initial software simulation versions of like very, very high level simulations, like, you know, a NATO right. simulation of exactly those components, because then we can get a sense of for different tasks, well, how big a system would one need? And I think right. that's, that could be a really good way of, of getting a feel for, um, yeah, get, getting a feel for what, what you could do if such a chip was designed. And to me, that's sort of the target I'd like to have for demos on Friday is, okay, here's some examples of what you could do with those sorts of components. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah, I agree. I think that would be good to kind of be able to drive through because I think, you know, if we were going to do, uh, say something for, you know, there's been interest in, I guess there's an IEEE sort of competition that like basically accelerates when you could actually get the, the chips fabricated. That's kind of the main thing. And it seems like there's a community they're going to build to have conversations around that. Um, I think those kinds of, that kind of work is going to be really important to, to sell that conversation. Uh, well, I, I think, think I think, and I'm sorry for my pedestrian proposals. Just what pedestrian? They were cool. I like it, Andreas. Cochlea. Or a simple... Uh, I like the simple one. Transceiver. Yeah, they are pedestrian, but they are practical. And my Ooh. goal is slightly different. I, it really is to provide... Uh, I mean, and I'm committed to do those two projects one way or another, and anybody wants mm -hmm. to come and contribute, we would try to do that and we'll contribute cells and libraries and everything to make it happen. But they're pedestrian. They're not very sexy. They're just a glorified microphone and a glorified camera. So, so in some red sense, it's a little bit different, but in another sense, opens up uh, the opportunity, number one, for people to learn, and number two, to share mm -hmm. the community is something which can work. Whether it's and, and I do think that even a pedestrian microphone with a classifier after it no, is still I, an interesting thing. No, it, it, it really is too complicated. Uh, it's too complicated, uh, Terry, too complicated. Getting a microphone with a good AR uh, output as Shichi will tell you or anybody else that built AR microphones is hard enough, you know. Getting a microphone to adapt, well, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, cochlea, I'm, I'm saying. No, no, it, 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 it's very hard. Yeah, yeah it is. It's very and hard. Especially if we, if we say, well, we, if um, I'm excited to have uh, Jennifer help with the floating gates to really put some really adaptation to really compensate for variability, do some learning. It's not, again, it's not very glorified. It's not going to solve the problems to work. And it, has simple interface, you can plug it in and you get something working. So I think that's my yeah. thinking, instead of trying to do something end to end, which, well, I mean, one, one can do, but it's many years. You're gonna spend five years uh, with mm -hmm. public domain tools to, uh, yeah, I mean. Anyway, that's my mm -hmm. thinking. Fair point. Uh, just a question. Uh, can we combine this cochlea and retina into a one chip? What? I didn't hear what you I said. I couldn't hear that. I couldn't. I couldn't yeah. understand. Yeah. Can we combine this retina and cochlea into just one chip? To do what? Why? I'm not sure why I would do that. Why? Why? Because, uh, like, anyways, you are. Uh, like you would get a lot of empty space uh, in one of the 10 millimeter square carvel and- No, you um, won't, believe me. You can use every single millimeter if you have it. And you can okay. make a good retina and a good cochlea. Okay, yeah, yeah that, I, I that would, was I would, a good- I would agree, I would agree, yeah. So that was exactly when, Before, you know, get something. Can you buy, uh, Nikhil, can you buy a camera with a microphone on the same chip today? I don't think you can buy one. No. Nope. Okay. And there's a good reason. Those people who want to use a microphone, they will use a microphone. And those people who want to use a camera, will use a camera. And those people who want to use both, will buy both, you know? <laughs> yes. And a camera with twice more pixels is more useful than one with a microphone. Yeah. yeah. Generally true. 
-hmm. I mean, if you can tell me, can you build a camera with an IMU on the single chip? I say, yeah, that's a useful thing, you know, for robotics. And mm -hmm. my my feeling on that would be that if if we were at the stage where there is an interesting complicated classifier as well built in, then I could see an argument for having both a camera and a microphone on the mm -hmm. same because device where they're both being fed into an on-chip classifier as well. Um, that you know, I, I could see, but that is a much more complicated classifier than anything we've been talking about so and, far. And, and, and it's also a case of where do you start to do that as a multi-chip module? I mean, that's really what you're, what, how you start really building that in practice. Yeah. And, 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 and what you would do for the microphone is you'd probably could just, you know, you'd have to, that's typically going to be a mem structure. You'd be putting it in the package, maybe if you can do it with a structure or something, but to do that, a MEMS process is a very different thing than what you would do for an IC design part. And there, there's, there, there are reasons that you separate these things. I mean, I, I think he was talking about cochlea and I said microphone. And so I <laughs> think we are being yeah. a little bit unfair, but the bottom line is that, yes. And so if we can get a big, uh, uh, 10 millimeter chip by 10 millimeter chip, we will, will put enough complexity or make big enough to really get something going. And there's a lot of support circuit nickel that mm -hmm. you will want to have around to make things work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah. as Jennifer said, I think, uh, you know, it would be nice to be a SOC. Uh, so you don't need to have another microcontroller. You don't need to go and get a, uh, ARM processor on a printer yeah. circuit board, just plug it in and go. I said three wires, but I said three wires because three wires avoid cheating. When you want to measure power, you measure the power on the two wires and you know how much yeah. power your whole system works. Yeah, although, Otherwise, yeah. although even if you have like a nice SPI or something, but yeah, I, I absolutely No, agree. no, no, Jennifer, the three wire, we, we won't be able to do three wire for a retina. I, I think we could, yeah, I yeah. suppose. But yes, well, SPI like a, I square yeah. C with programmable, you can yeah. come up with a nice protocol. I think there's a lot of really interesting work to interface. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely so, agree. So now th this particular um, uh, Skywater uh, eFabless Google uh, process yeah. or, or um, yeah. resource, right, includes, um, in fact, a risk processor, right? On, on it does, the, on the yeah, it, it's a risk five. So yes. So, it's, so it's a rich why can't you make advantage, and, take advantage of, of everything that Tim Edwards and yeah. ours have been developing there? It, it's a great resource, right? It's all there, yes, and including all the programming, we... all the support for, in fact, they even provide a board. Uh, they can plug this thing into. Yeah. So they, everything they, should they, be provided. Yeah, I, I think all no. of that is really, really helpful. They, they, they are willing to put do a bump bond onto the board. That's how they're putting this together. Uh, I think it works well. I will. I will say that there is a huge. At least we have been noticing there's a huge advantage when you actually have a processor and board. You use it. We've been doing this a lot with our FPA devices for the last seven years. It, it really does sort of change things and change how you handle the standard interfaces. It's just right there, and you don't worry. Um, people always ask me what I use the processor for. It's like heavily for communication and uh, memory and the I/O memory management of what has to be done and. Just stuff that stuff that goes on all the time, uh, and it's huge because then you quit worrying. You know, interfacing quits becoming a problem anymore. And so I think that's I think one of the things that we're all talking about would be a good thing to do. But yeah, there's a lot you can use for that. There's also it's also quite I think it's also very relevant when you have a processor there because then it becomes very clear of where do you make a distinction? What do you want to do on the analog side? What do you want to do on the digital side? you really have an apples to apples comparison, at least in one process to play with. And that's probably the best comparisons you can use. Yes, uh, I'm, first, I'm all for the five already. We have three chips, two big ones. Uh, the big ones have two silicon five and S7 and S21. The small one right. has an S7 with one megabyte of RAM and they're just running the whole system. We have the whole complete flow to compile programs. We have actually, a, a, I mean, one of the, I mean, one of the uh, small networks, DNNs running on a chip that we built with Silicon 5, I mean, with Hi5 and the accelerator, an Arduino-like chip. So I'm all for that. But I think, again, the practical aspects of it is there's a lot of work to be done to really make something concrete. Oh. The other thing with the 130 is that um, my understanding, this process has TSVs eventually. 
Um, I, I heard that. I heard that. I, I, yeah. So are there TSPs? So I'm excited because one could actually build 3D structures in the future. So um, maybe they won't give the TSVs to public. Very cool. But, so I think there is value in really learning how to design something in this technology. Uh, okay. uh, may, may so I... That's why I'm excited about it. So may I barge in um, that, um, I mean, if I, if I, I remember uh, Tim Edwards, not for his uh, logarithmic uh, uh, externally linear filters, which uh, is what you're supposed to remember him for, but for pot boxes. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm thinking of is, uh, can, can, the, uh, can the caravel or the analog caravan uh, be, um, be extended, used or extended into something like an on-chip pot box. So, I mean, what you what you need to do if you're playing with neuro, with analog or neuromorphic circuits is you need all sorts of um, biases. And okay, Toby's is one of them, and the others is uh, if you uh, if you do a um, if you if you basically take the idea that Tim Edwards had with pot boxes and put that on on a chip, that would be a worthwhile Please. thing, uh, in my opinion. But okay, Please, we do that, man. That's why it's important to do the bias generators on Toby. Everybody does that. And the key component to do that is the bias generators that Toby designed. So that actually happens today. A very, the only time we'll use an external volt source is when it has to be low impedance because then you need, you need a voltage amplifier, you need a low impedance yeah. of, uh, source follower. But, but I mean, yeah, to get to get technical in in what I mean, uh, it's, this is uh, for Nikhil. That I mean, uh, yes, there's this bias generator, and um, okay, an Arduino is all as something better than an Arduino is already in this framework that you need to live with anyway. And hooking up a bias generator to that Risk Five framework and programming it that would be something that uh, is highly valuable to be done. Yeah. I, yes, uh, I, 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 I mean think... a bias generator, floating gate element, but yeah. These are things are always done on chip anymore. I absolutely agree. And in the in the report that I send you, you see how we spend a lot of time being able to generate high voltage on the chip from low voltage and really mm -hmm. controlling and routing it. Chris, yeah. I sent Chris a report uh, in a private email, and the reason is because you want to have everything on the, on board, and that is mm -hmm. really hard. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah. So there are uh, magnitudes of, uh, in order of magnitudes of current we have to generate for uh, functioning of this TVS and everything. So yeah, those those bias generators are really important. And also, you need a bank of reference. You're not going to be able to do that without a bank of reference. If you're going to do that, you need to build the bank of reference, and that is also not trivial. You know, again, uh, there's some really nice designs out there. Most people would take a voltage from outside, but if you really want to have something that really works self-contained, yeah. you also mm -hmm. need a bank of reference. I, I, actually, I, actually, I, I, actually yeah. you, you definitely need a voltage, a clean voltage reference to work with. I, I completely agree. There's a couple ways to do it, but yeah, I mean, and that's something worth, I mean, again, one of the critical pieces you gotta have. I mean, so uh, making a bank up in 130, that is a good design and fabbing it and sharing it in the community, it doesn't have to be, 0.01% over the whole commercial range, but something that it will give you, it will yeah. track uh, temperature reasonably uh, within so a, I, I would, yeah, I would either think a good band gap or, you know, there's also a couple, that, I mean, there's, there's a couple of re related structures. I'm thinking one, that, one or two, that's even one that's a floating gate version of it. That's really robust on it. Um, that's competitive. <laughs> I think any of those would be great. It'd be great to have. Well, Anything I mean, that um, can give you constant voltage over correct. the temperature. And, and uh, minimum voltage even point. better. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, I'm wondering whether a band gap reference, which is uh, making putting in very lot, very much effort to be temperature compensated, is is or isn't overkill. So, I mean, in Toby's bias generator, there was this four transistor structure with a an external resistor. And actually, in one of the few chips that I actually produced at Gertz Lab, uh, that was uh, in in Jetcast uh, with Mike Chi, I uh, put a uh, I put this uh, this ref this reference there with uh, when uh, and I substituted the external resistor with a above threshold long uh, de degradation transistor. And okay, so this is this is one of one of the few designs at Gertz Lab that actually worked with of mine. That's the Jetcast, and I, I basically redrew it, uh, which just, just as proof of concept, uh, up to the transistor you numbers know, so far. 
If we're going to do things and the neuromorphic community is going to say that we build devices that are really useful, you know, I mean, you really need to have a bank of reference on a chip. I mean, or a bank of reference outside the chip, a three pin device that will provide you the constant voltage that you need to on the chip and most people do it. But I'm just saying that these are the kind of things that you make devices, you make neuromorphic systems and you try to do something real in, a, in an integrated way and then it doesn't work because the temperature changes and everything changes and the biases changes. Well, um, I mean, the, the, sorry, the, the, no, but I have to, I've what been listening with great interest, but I have to disagree with you, Andreas, at least if you're making DVS, not one of them has a band gap reference. They but all the use PTET, sorry, let me just finish. Yeah. They all use PTET bias generator that generates a PTET current and the circuits, the DVS pixel circuit is designed so that it's temperature insensitive. And so, you know, the supply voltage doesn't matter because the Widlar bootstrap mirror generates a current that independent of the supply voltage largely and all the currents uh, scale proportional to temperature and that keeps all the transconductance constant and it works out in the pixel that is temperature independent and none of those things need a precise voltage reference they're all they all need they're all designed so they work with uh, current ratios right as long I get as the current ratios are constant then it then it is very constant performance over temperature except for junction leakage and band gap reference won't help you with that. It's different if you want to measure absolute things, like you're building a bioamplifier or something, you really want to measure absolute voltage. Then you need a precise um, voltage reference. Okay, uh, let's let's have that discussion in a, in a, because I think there's subtleties in everything that uh, you discuss. I agree. And that's why I recommended that they build the, that the first thing we do, we do the bias generators that you created, Toby. Those are really the first thing to do, but um, in the longer term, I think and it's not, uh, yeah. So by the way, Bernabe is much better at building small bias generators that really work quite well too. He, so if you right. want to build a small one that, you know, our bias generator, since we build big chips anyway, every DVS is a big chip. It doesn't matter if the bias generator itself is pretty big. Like the equivalent area of one bias is almost like one uh, pad. And they're complex. They're really complex beasts, these bias generators. You know, they have lots of digital configuration. They have lots of different analog blocks. Just designing this full a digital bias generator with all the configuration is not is you know it's going to take somebody like several months of work yes. to do in a new process just yes. for that piece yes it's true that's what yeah. that's the argument it's not something you can throw together in a day but unless you have that no. you cannot do anything you know well, um, or, i mean toby uh, i mean you build a, you, you uh, i mean the, the stuff that you publish are are uh, are bias generators which are pretty universal which have lots of switches and bells and whistles because they need to be uh, suitable for universal. all the different cases so i mean if you uh, i mean uh, i'm 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 i've just got uh, i just uh, with with uh, jennifer i went through uh, her actual layout and i noticed how tiny uh, the space actually is so, uh, I mean, the art there would be that you basically have a general recipe of the bias generators and then a, well, a current divider maybe where they actually the transistor sizes match the bias generator that you have matching between the, the bias generator and the, and the division network. And then you, uh, then you implement only what you actually need. And uh, I mean, if you, if you want the general case and uh, I mean, I, I absolutely see and appreciate the value of what, you've, what, you're, what you're doing. Uh, but it's if you, if you have a, yeah, if, if you have a specific chip, uh, you need to uh, you need to find uh, a recipe how to simplify okay. that. But what here's the problem. Need. Here's the problem. In the beginning, we had a bias generator compiler. I actually had an, uh, a compiler. Nobody uh, bothered to build such a bias generator compiler after that. Problem is, every time you go to a different process, you have to redo everything. You have to yeah. redo all the simulations, everything. That's always a problem. The problem is, if you make a specific bias generator for each for your particular chip it's very common to make a mistake in that. And I've seen at least two or three chips that had mistakes in the bias generator just killed the chip dead. That's why when we did this big multi-project um, chip, we just evolved now this general bias generator and throw it on every chip. Then that gives you assurance that even if you, you can't possibly make a mistake by getting the sex of the bias wrong or getting the scale of the bias current range wrong, you have full generality on the bias current. You can make it N or P type. You can make it uh, use a shifted source uh, current mirror. You can uh, set the buffer strength. You know the, the the buffers, the bias voltage. All that is programmable, and that saved us many times 
from mistakes um, in the design yes. because always the last thing you integrate is the bias generator and that's where you make the mistakes because it's right at the end. And, and Toby, you know, that's yeah. why I suggested if someone wants to really start doing some analog design and learning how to use new tools, start with a bias generator, do a good bias generator, then we can, because we'll use yeah. it, you know? Well, it's, I actually, it's... Act, actually, I'm thinking about that, but Toby, I, I probably would have to pester you about that. I mean, I, I just pestered no, you have to pester. I'd, I'd have to, I, I just pestered Jennifer about the, all the magic details and I'd have to pester you about uh, the really fine points where to put a cast code in the, in the, in the bias and, block and all that. And Chris, to say what Toby said, it, it's true. And I was going to, I was thinking last night that I should really upload the paper by Bernabe. Um, they have really a very nice paper on bias generators. And they also give you the sizes of the transistors and the mismatch and the variability the questions that you were asking me earlier, and I said, well, make everything square and uh, to start no. with, well, yes, yeah, make everything square or device square, you minimize variability, Toby, that's period. Well, that may be true, but it, you also you also reduce overhead. You also reduce um, the, what is it called, the vol supply voltage room that you have, the headroom. You reduce the right. dynamic range of the bias generator. 130 nanometer is really an ancient process, so we don't really have to worry about that. But uh, well, you do. We have to worry about it, right? In our design, well, that's know. where we I had to do some really sizing. Yeah. yeah, but the Bernabe has the really to good, work right. Bernabe has a really good uh, design recipes of how to do the mismatch and uh, and all that. It's a wonderful paper. Yep. Yeah. No, I, but I think the I think one of the biggest things that comes out of this. I mean, I agree with all of that. I think the biggest thing you're all saying is that. There's a huge there's a huge win of not only doing the 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 core things first, which is essential, is also the programmability of some form or another is essential in any of these structures, and to do it in a way that still keeps the robust behavior. Uh, I think we would all agree that that's critical. Um, I certainly have my own biases of how I handle that with certain floating <laughs> structures, but but it certainly um, but. But but the, but it, but then the same philosophy holds. You've got to get the right sort of core structures and do it such that way it just happens all the time. Yeah, and so, I yes, mean, I mean, and, and the same with AAR. I mean, and I talked to Nikhil great. that will will automatically translate one of our 130 nanometer TSMC layouts. We'll try to do that to 130 uh, Skywater. Yeah. So because you need leaf cells, you need to compile, and we need to figure out how to compile that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, and you know, they're having an a having having at least a flavor of AR compilable is a really useful thing. And there's a couple different things we could use there, but I agree. So the 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 actual work to build a neuromorphic chip is really very un unglamorous at the beginning because you're building all the okay. infrastructures you need to use, you know, to really get working chips going. You know. Yeah. Sorry to say that. Mm. I mean, then you just you just find a proper venue to you just find the proper venue to publish that in. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> the, that, no, the that appreciates the unglamorousness. Is that this is going to be out in the public and everybody's <laughs> going to cite one paper that you're going to write that is going to have fifty authors and it's going to describe everything that you built. You know. <laughs> This reminds me of how I got started with the neuromorphic thing in 1995. That was actually Karl-Heinz Meyer. And of course, in the Atlas collaboration has, all, has, has also a pre pretty lengthy uh, author's list on every paper. So <laughs> it's coming full circle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. That's, a group, that's what European groups do. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Cool. Well, I think we've had a good discussion on this and at this point I probably should hand it over to Terry at this point. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyway, for... just one point for Terry, just quick. Yeah. Terry, uh, Toby, if you're going to do any charge-based, any charge-based circuits for neuromorphic sy systems, you're going to need a bank up reference. Okay, period. End well, of the story. Well, we, yeah, you definitely need a very constant voltage so source, absolutely. Okay. And uh, the second thing, uh, to get efficiency, if you're going to do any processing, you really should be doing uh, bank up uh, charge based uh, circuits. That's really what 90% of the people doing actually computational circuits out there now. So at the end of the day, we will need a bank up. So anyway, that's that's all I said. Uh, okay, so stupid stupid question from somebody who's, who who ha really hasn't touched this stuff for quite a while. Um, 
So uh, why can't you get away with ratios with charge-based systems? Is there a non-linearity that- At the, uh, at the end of the day, you need a, you need a voltage that is gonna be your reference, period. And in the worst case, why can't we have that voltage being supplied outside of the chip? Yes, you can do that. Uh, <laughs> and that's what we do <laughs> when we don't have the bank of reference. Yes, that's They're correct. cheap, little chips, right? I no, I mean, I mean, if if I mean, if if we if we want if we want a a constant voltage, a constant band gap, then we build one, of course. And okay, there should be this emergency pin that you can bypass it if or, if it fails. But um, but I mean, I'm 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 not I'm not getting the argument why uh, why why voltage ratios don't do the trick. Why you need the absolute voltage? Okay, um, you really have to get into the weeds of uh, really building the circuits. Anyway. I, I don't claim that I'm asking anybody to really build a bank of reference. We will build one because I think it's a useful block to have, but that's how it goes. <laughs> and you can buy a three pin bank of reference and put it externally and it would just do great, period. Or a Zener diet. I mean, okay. I mean, it's. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, as um, I'm just paying too much attention on Toby's bias generator, and I was just saying that. Okay, I'm trying to copy that because I didn't know. Oh, no, that, I think you're you're, you're telling me better first, right now. That is the first sort of business to build. <laughs> yeah, it, it it's a very important thing to build. Although at this point, I think I I will shift it over to Terry. I think he was going to talk about some stuff as well. Right, oh. Terry. Yep, that's you're plan. Welcome. Let me, uh, so on a completely different note, although I think we'll be pretty related for, um, or hopefully some of these designs of, of some of these chips, um, this question of online learning has been coming up in a lot of the different discussions. And I wanted to take this opportunity to point out some potentially unintuitive things. Um, and this is work um, partly by me, partly it's been things that have been coming out of work by uh, my two postdocs, Madeline Bartlett and Michael Furlong, um, both of which have been very much enjoying Telluride. Um, but, um, so, the, and so the particular thing I wanna talk about is fine, here's a really simple neural network, some input, some hidden layer of neurons, some output, connection weights between them, so this is a, you know, standard, pretty standard neural network, could be spiking, could be non-spiking, whatever. Um, I generally, for simplicity, work with a situation where this is, where the input is linear, the output is linear, um, and, um, and the only non-linearity is in the middle. Um, so that just simplifies the math a little bit. Um, but that's the sort of situation that I'm gonna be talking about, and of course, the output is some weighted sum of the activities of these neurons. The activities could be spiking, could be non-spiking, whatever. The learning rule that I tend to focus on and use a lot is just standard classic delta rule, um, which is some learning rate, the activity of the hidden layer neurons multiplied by the difference between what I would like the output to be, that's T, my target value, um, minus what the actual output currently is, which is Y here. Okay. Um, this is, if you try to, if you use backprop and ask backprop, okay, what is the right weight update for this set of weights for this situation? This is also the equation that backprop will tell you if you are updating these weights. Backprop will also give you an update for these other weights over here, but um, that'll be, you know, and then the classic problem with implementing backprop in hardware would be, oh, well, hey, the update rule for these weights over here involves knowing these weights. And that's a problem. We're gonna ignore that problem for the purposes of this talk because we're just gonna be focusing on updating these weights because it's a nice, simple learning problem. Um, not only is it simple, but if you adjust it slightly, if, you, if that input is not just locked to be some sort of okay, I, my, my, my error has to be of this form of the target minus what my actual thing is. If this whole input is, is just sort of an external input to the circuit, that we're just gonna call E. Now all of a sudden this rule lets you do a whole bunch of different things. So I, I can do prediction, I can do conditioning, do reinforcement learning, and do adaptive motor control, um, all just by adjusting what this signal is coming in off E. Um, um, so, so that, 
one nice thing is that means you've implemented one learning role. You can go ahead and um, give do lots of different demos of things your system can now do. Um, uh, and as I said, uh, whenever I've used this sort of learning rule in sort of a spiking case, um, because the activity there is now a spiking activity um, in those situations. So for instance, when we do this learning rule on Luigi, what we actually tend to do is take this activity and do a low pass filter on this activity. And that's the value that we end up using. Um, the, that tends to be the a pretty good thing to do. Um, relatively simple to implement it's all local computation one fun thing that'll come up later in the talk that is a little bit of a gotcha is for some of these interesting applications you want a little bit of history of your activity you want to be multiplying this error by the activity in the recent past um, so that's one slight little thing that um, yeah and it will will come up that could complicate any sort of neuromorphic implementation that's the context that I want to talk about. Um, fun things that come up out of this system. One thing that I really like is there is a meaningful way of setting the learning rate. So in a lot of neural network sort of situations, it's really hard to decide what the learning rate should be. Um, but in um, but in a lot of these applications. Um, I do think there's a there's sort of a principled way that you can set this learning rate. Um, and the principle is to sort of go back to what you, so um, to ignore the neurons and imagine what you want the learning rate to be doing. So as an example, here is the this top thing, that's the standard equation for TD learning. So this is the standard reinforcement learning algorithm where you're doing something like, oh, I know the value of a particular state and I'm going to have some sort of update of that state. Um, so, okay, I do some calculations. Um, this is what I think my value should be. Um, update my state to go towards this new value, but put some scaling factor here. And this scaling factor at this sort of level um, sort of is meaningful interpretable. So if I set the scaling factor to one, that means totally ignore what I currently think about the value of the state and jump to whatever my current observation is telling me the value of the state is. That's, that's what an alpha of one means, right? Because the value of my current state cancels out. Um, an alpha of zero means don't update anything at all. Um, and then if you have um, larger alphas, um, then you, you're saying, well, how many observations do I need in order to update my state? Um, well, not how many, but um, if alpha was 0 0.9, then, you know, fine, then I'm, or if alpha was 0 0.1, then I'm updating from my current value to my target value by about 10%. So that has a somewhat meaningful interpretation, but that learning parameter is not the same as the learning parameter in, um, in the delta rule um, update. But the nice thing is you can actually say from, you know, if you're using this learning rule and you're using it to implement this sort of, you know, okay, um, you're using it, you're using this learning rule to be a neural network that is sort of taking the role of one of these lookup table learning type things. Um, then we can actually convert between the two, right? Because I know this is, this is actually Delta rule, right? So that's my actual neural network learning parameter. Um, I know the output of my network is the weighted sum of uh, those activities. So if I just combine those two equations, I get this. I do some rearranging, I get this. And that means that the actual effective update that I will get, if I want an alpha of 0.1, then I can actually set my learning rate parameter to be alpha scaled by the uh, sum of the, uh, the square sum, the square of the norm of the activities. Um, in practice, I often, um, I don't tend to compute this on the fly. I tend to just sort of, okay, given a certain setup, I know I have certain sort of expected activity of my neurons. Um, basically, I don't want to have to do this computation every time step or every instant. Um, but this will can at least give me a good number that will actually say, oh, okay, this is about what my activity should be. 
And the important thing to note here is that this scaling factor really changes, um, or the importance of this, if I do something like double my number of neurons, all right, that's gonna indicate that I should scale, I should drop my learning rate in half. Um, also, if I adjust the sparsity of my neurons, that's gonna change the, this norm. So if I adjust the sparsity of my neurons, then I also need to adjust this learning rate in order to compensate for that. Um, so I found that incredibly helpful for, as I'm playing around with different aspects of the setup of the model, um, I can at least set a learning rate that is sort of meaningful and consistent. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a surprising thing you can do with this approach. Um, the other big aspect that I wanted to talk about, though, is there's some interesting practical issues if you're using this sort of online learning where you don't have access to something like Backprop, which would be able to do all sorts of fun optimization. Um, and the biggest things are, well, there's no batching, which means, um, so, um, which is the net normal thing in neural networks that um, uh, you sort of gather data over over a period of time and then do your update. Um, if you're, uh, that's only suitable really for offline learning. Um, the standard stories for how to deal with that are things like lowering the learning rate and going with a sparser representation. Um, we'll show how that affects in a moment. Um, but I think the, really the, what I wanna really praise on it is if there is no backprop, then you need to start with a good set of features. Um, so let me rephrase that again. If you're only learning this set of weights, you need to make sure this set of weights is good for the task that you're doing. Right? This, this is the traditional problem that perceptrons and neural networks has just always struggled with. Um, and so if we're not going to be using on, you know, if we're going to be doing online learning and we don't have to have access to the backdrop solution to this problem, what are we going to do? Um, and here's what I want to do to sort of show an example of how important this is and our particular techniques for doing that, um, I want to show a very particular example um, of just really simple reinforcement learning using this rule. Um, so this is the basic reinforcement learning algorithm. This is sort of the actor critic approach. Um, while, and if you're doing this without a neural network, if you're just doing this with a big lookup table that says, okay, for each state, I have a particular value. And for each state action pair, I have a particular um, probability of, of doing that action. So you can sort of think of those things. Um, the, if you have that set up, then the actor critic learning rule says, oh, okay, do this calculation that gives you an error. And you change your value, the value of your current state, you change by this amount. So, oh, hey, look, I've observed something that, you know, I thought that I was in a bad state, but then I got a reward and I got myself into a new state that's actually, that I think is a pretty good state. So therefore I need to update whatever that previous state that I was in that I thought was bad, it turns out to be better than I thought it was. So I need to update that value of that state. All right, that's the intuition behind this, this critic part. And then the actor part is saying, well, hold on a second. If I, the same logic, if I, find myself in a situation where I'm surprised and I got more reward than I was expecting, then that also means I should update, well, if I was in that state before where I got that and I did that, whatever action I did that got me the surprising reward, I should really increase my chances of doing that action. So, so that's the basic actor critic reinforcement learning rule. I hope we can see that we can convert both of these rules into a neural network um, that is just learning with, with delta rule. Um, we're actually just gonna do it as one neural network where I'm feeding in the state information and my output from the neural network, one, I've got multiple outputs. One output is what's the value of the current state. The next output is what's the probability that I should do action zero in this state? What's the probability I should do action one in this state, action two and so on. Um, one caveat in what I just said there, I should not be using the term probability there because these things don't add up to one or they aren't constrained to do that. Um, these are the values that I'm going to feed into a softmax function in order to choose my, um, in order to choose an action. They're sometimes called logits, um, but you can also just think of them as probabilities. Um, in any case, uh, well, that don't add to one, but whatever. So, um, 
tendencies to do particular actions is all I mean by that. Um, but then the idea is, cool, you have some system that computes this, which is my error signal. Right? That's the error signal that's being fed into this set of weights. Um, and we just do delta rule. So again, this is an example of as long as you have delta rule, you can do a lot of different things. Um, this is also one place where that interesting caveat comes up when you actually do this and you implement this rule, this activity needs to be the activity on the previous time step. Um, so that becomes a thing that becomes, you wanna make sure that your hardware implementation can do that. All right, so that's a setup that means that we can do a lot of different things with this with this learning role. What happens as we play around with the encoding? What happens as we play around with what's going on at this first set of the network? And what I wanna point out here is we get very different behavior, um, but we can sort of understand what's going on. Here. So one extreme case you could do is you could set up this first set of weights such that there's one neuron for each state and whatever state you're in, and again, so the so the task here is you are an agent running around in a maze, you are at a particular location, you are facing in a particular direction, and you get a reward when you hit the green square. That's it, that's your task. Um, this is even a grid, so there's actually a finite number of states in this particular task. Um, and so as sort of this extreme example, what I could do is I could set up one neuron for each state and I could set up these weights and set up this input such that exactly one of these neurons would be on at any given time. And if you do that, then everything I've just described becomes exactly the same as the standard lookup table solution to this problem. The lookup table is just to these weights now. Um, so I like this because it lets me do a comparison to the horribly inefficient lookup table approach. Um, but I can do that. Um, what I'm plotting here on the right, so, so we run this for 500 trials. Um, we show, oh, hey, look, it does learn. And this is sort of the optimal solution to the task. Just go straight to the goal. Um, and you can, these up here can be a little bit of a pain to look at, but what's this, this is actually just a printout in the top right of the lookup table. This is saying, okay, um, a, the horizontal here, uh, so this column is if my agent is currently facing north, currently facing south, currently facing west, currently facing north. So those are my uh, four directions. Um, the grid itself is what my location of the agent is. That's my X, Y location. And then this top row is its learned value. This is it. So it has learned what it thinks the value of each of these states is. So this is its value for, if I am at this location and I am facing east, then I think my value is pretty high. Um, if I am at this location and I am facing south, then I think my value is pretty high. Um, so that's the value part. That's the, the critic part of the actor critic system. And then these are the, well, how, um, how good are the different actions at this current state? Um, this is sometimes a little hard to read, so I will some collapse it down to this bottom thing. And what this is indicating is at each of these states and each of these locations, um, what will it do? And so, and the different colors are uh, blue is move forward, um, red is turn left, green is turn right. So this is saying that if I'm at this location and I'm facing east, then I will move forward move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward. Now I will turn right. So now I'm facing west, or no, so now I'm facing south. So now I will move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward. Now we'll get to my time task. And of course, there's some noise in the system such that it also might do the wrong task. Um, so, so Question, Terry. Yep. This black region on the left here, this black shaded thing that I see at the bottom of the left, it does not mean anything? It's no uh, Oh, sorry, in, in, in this graph over here? Yeah, this. I'm not, I'm not using that in this case. In, in, okay. The, okay. in the real system, or in, in the ver various versions of the system, you can also feed in more information for the state about what things the agent can currently see. Um, I'm not doing that in this case. So that, the shaded okay. area is supposed to indicate what region it can currently see. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Um, all right, so this is, so that, is just showing that this case, if you set it up with really weird features, you can just, it 
just do the standard lookup table approach. Um, that, okay. Here's another option. So this is, let's use, so the neural engineering framework, the this Nango stuff that I've talked about, or that, I don't know, that I mentioned various different times that I play with a lot, has a particular method for randomly generating these weights such that you get a wide, um, a range of tuning curves in this layer that at least in some cases seems to match pretty well with what you see in biology. Okay. If we just do that, this is what we get. So first of all, it does not, it learns, but not as well. And you're seeing that we get very, very smooth patterns out here. So it'll still solve the task ish. Um, but what we're, what we're seeing here is that by, by default, um, or so one way to think about this is it doesn't seem to be able to learn these really sharp changes that the, um, that this policy, the lookup table really likes. It really likes being able to, okay, if I'm here, I do one thing. If I'm right next to that, I do something else. Right? And that seems to be difficult for the default representation where I just take this input and pass it through a layer of neurons and feed it into my system. Okay? That sort of thing is just a little bit difficult. For me. Certainly, I give it enough neurons, it'll do it. No problem, but enough neurons might be a lot. Um, and it also might require dropping my learning rate a lot um, and running it for more, many more times. Um, so, all right, so that's an interesting thing. Another way to look at what's happening there is if you look at what those individual neurons are sensitive to. So if you take a look at, so in the, in the lookup table case, I was saying, okay, each neuron is sensitive to one particular input pattern or one particular state. If I take a look at this random case, if I'm just taking state as a bunch of values feeding into a, a set of connection weights, I'm going to get neurons that tend to look things like this. So this, these are four different neurons. Okay, again, north, um, east, south, west, and north are the different facings. So this is a neuron that is sensitive. This top one is a neuron that's sensitive to being sort of on the right, maybe a little bit lower on the grid, but not particularly sensitive to what orientation I'm at. Um, here's a neuron that is really only sent that is pretty sensitive to, hey, I'm on the rightmost column. Um, these, are, these are the sorts of things you get if you randomly generate this set of weights, and that's all you do. Okay. And what I'm pointing out here is that these tend to be very broad tuning curves. These are neurons that are sensitive to a broad area. Okay. Um, all right. So that's so. What we would like is we would like another option that can make or make our neurons a little bit sparser, a little bit more sensitive to local areas, but maybe not as extreme as what we get in the lookup table approach. I've got a whole separate video to talk about exactly what the math is behind or why we ended up doing this, but the particular approach that I've been getting a lot of success from is randomly generate some high dimensional vectors. The star is circular convolution and this exponent is the circular convolution equivalent of an exponent. Um, this is well-defined math. What what you end up getting if you, you do that is your input and then pass it through a random weight matrix. Um, you can also vary, this forces all of my input points to be on the surface of a hypersphere. That also means that I can now have a nice parameter. I could, by playing with the biases of these neurons, I can now adjust their sparsity and still be guaranteed that I'm representing all points in the space. Um, this seems to be a really nice mapping where now I get a solutions that, um, the, you know, here's the solutions that I get out here, I tend to be able to learn much faster. Okay, so this is faster than the lookup table approach um, because we are getting some generalization, but we're not getting too much generalization. Um, and we, and we do have sort of a free parameter to adjust that. Um, this is the sort of thing that um, if you randomly generate these sorts of neurons, you, this is the sort of things the neurons might be sensitive to. So I might have a neuron that's sensitive to this particular pattern up here. And you're like, wow, that's a weird, complicated pattern. All right, fine. Um, yeah, I've got another neuron sensitive to this. I've got another neuron sensitive to this. And you know, here's a neuron that's only sensitive to this one point. So these sorts of patterns tend to fall out of that. 
and and we have a free parameter that lets me adjust how sparse these parameter these representations are. Um, this, 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 um, so if people are familiar with radial basis function encoding, it's somewhat similar, um, uh, but with the exception, but you're getting sort of very random patterns. There's also this weird side effect that in this represent style of representation, there are no harsh bounds. Um, I'm plotting it as if it has bounds, but um, there aren't, um, it, it generalizes out. Um, you can also, if you're interested in biological type stuff, instead of having these sorts of random patterns, you can also choose it such that these things look like grid cells, um, which happen in the brain and sort of ongoing research to figure out whether that's useful. Um, you do have a couple free parameters though. You have a free parameter on um, a scaling factor that you can choose to put in on this exponent. And that's basically saying something like, values that are close to each other if i learn about one point in my state space how much does that tell me about nearby points in the, in the state space you know and what nearby counts as so that's like you have that free parameter and you have the free parameter of how sparse you want your neural networks to be um the um uh, there is also then it's also raises the issue of well i've got to now convert back and forth between X, Y, theta, and this thing. Um, I generally find that I will, if I'm working in neurons, I will just stick with this style of representation. Um, uh, you can convert back and forth in neurons. It's just pretty expensive in neurons. Um, but anyway, so that's what we tell there. Okay, um, that's some weird stuff. If this is any of this stuff is grabbing you and finding you know might be important for the sort of work that you are you are doing, uh, please talk to me and I, I can point you with more videos um, that sort of talk about these representations. The take home message that I wanted to say is Delta rules really simple and flexible. If you can only implement one learning rule in hardware, pick this one. Um, the you can do a whole bunch of different types of computations um, if you can just generate different error signals. And we can either do that by neurons. Um, I didn't really talk about that here, but you can do that with neurons. And that's why we will sometimes, when we do that, we will, um, uh, I sometimes call this the PES rule. Um, that's more about um, when we're doing it with neurons. Um, but you can also have that error signal just done by traditional hardware, if that makes sense to, on your situation. Is it running on the host computer? Is it just an external error signal that you're getting um, on Luigi and Spinnaker? You're just you know, often are just computing this externally. Um, um, do, 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 do. And if you are doing this this style of learning, configuring that earlier layer really matters in a way that we're, may not be useful, may not be used to if you're only used to using background. Um, and so playing around with these sparse representation things seem really useful. Um, and this weird circular convolution style representation I was talking about also seems pretty well suited, but that's also ongoing research. All right, uh, that's my whirlwind overview. Are there quick questions or we need to go on to the next uh, speaker? You have to go on, I'm sorry, Terry. Uh, that was awesome as usual with your lovely presentation, so practical and useful for people that wanna do things. Uh, but I think this is the NMC slot already, right? Yep, I'm sorry about that. Um, I was bad host. Um, please ask questions in the chat and I will do that. And we should go on to the uh, NMC group. So thank yeah. you. You were That's not awesome. a bad host. I think the people, the discussion before took too long. Mm -hmm. Gassing on. Yep. So All you're right. going to take over um, Garrett or Rodolph, right? You guys are in charge now. Um, I can probably introduce uh, um, Alessio. I think Alessio will speak first. Um, so for those of you who have attended uh, Eve's talk um, in the first week, we heard about um, um, studies of the um, STG system um, under temperature variations. And um, Eve showed the diversity of um, behaviors that can happen just because of temperature variations. And um, 
Alessio Franchi, who is a professor at UNAM uh, over the last six years, perhaps, um, has been at the very forefront of um, developing um, new analysis methods to make sense of those um, of those phenomena and and provide some organization principles. And I think that's the idea of, of the talk today and 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 how we can use this. Um, singularity as, as organizing principles when we want to replicate um, the diversity of such behaviors in, in Silico. Yeah. So please, Alessio. Thanks, Rodolfo. I'll share my screen. So, yes, the, the, the talk I'm going to give today is about this, uh, some recent work. Um, I have the, the chance and the honor to, uh, to develop in collaboration with, uh, um, with Eve Marder and Tim, who you also met in the uh, panel of the first week in neuromorphic control, and Jacob, who is uh, a PhD student with, uh, with Eve. And this is the reference about uh, the experimental part and the modeling part that we talk uh, about today. And uh, I will try to connect the relevance of these results for neuromorphic engineering, because the discussion we had in this week uh, results that the same kind of um, unavoidable perturbations that happens in uh, uh, an actual neural system like temperature variation or pH variation also affect neuromorphic uh, circuits, for instance, due to uh, transistor mismatch. So just a quick resume of the type of uh, experimental model I will be talking about. You have already seen this in, uh, uh, in each talk. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, stomatic gastric ganglion of the crab, which is this 30 neuron circuit um, whose simplified circuit diagram uh, uh, is this one. It's a purely inhibitory uh, neuronal circuit, and you have this pair of neurons, which is the AB, ABPD neuron, which is the core uh, pacemaker of this of this circuit. And here you have the uh, the circuit behavior with this beautiful, extremely stable and reliable three phasic uh, rhythm, which sends uh, electrical signals to uh, the muscles responsible for chewing and, sw and swallowing uh, uh, in the crown. And so. This circuit has become uh, the, the model for control theoretical approaches and for control theoretical questions in, uh, in neuroscience because uh, it's sufficiently robust to uh, perturb it and see how it reacts to different kinds uh, of external stimuli. So what I'm showing here is the first key observation that can be made on this model, that is neural circuits are extremely robust to uh, the uh, component uh, variability in terms of the underlying parameters. So in this schematic representation, I'm considering four STG circuits from four different animals. And when you take these four circuits, these four instances of the, uh, the STG and measure the functional output, not surprisingly, you find exactly the same functional output because all of these animals must be able to swallow and chew, etc. However, when you go and measure the underlying biophysical parameter, for instance, synaptic strength, or intrinsic uh, conductance densities, you find a huge variability uh, across the animal, uh, the animal population. For instance, this distance of the SDG, uh, this, synaptic, this synaptic connection strength is much stronger than the same, con than the same uh, synapse, but in a different instance uh, of the SDG, or this cell in this instance of the SDG has a much larger intrinsic conductance density as compared to the same cell in another instance uh, of the SDG. Uh, and neural circuits also exhibit another kind of property, another kind of robustness, that is robustness to um, global perturbation. So you are keeping this circuit in a petri dish, in a saline solution, and you can change the temperature of the saline solution, you can change the acidity of this uh, saline solution, and look at how the functional output change as you change uh, this uh, uh, environmental, uh, this global perturbation, this environmental parameter. And what it turns out is that at least up to a certain limit, this circuit is robust to temperature and pH and other types of perturbation in the sense that, for instance, if you increase temperature, the rhythm 
might speed up a little bit, but the trophasic pattern, so the functional output of this circuit remain, uh, remains perfectly intact. Uh, so what happens beyond these critical points uh, where uh, the system behavior crashes, so where the, uh, the nominal behavior doesn't, doesn't appear anymore? So let's take pH, uh, pH perturbation. What Jacob did was to isolate the uh, ABPD uh, STG pacemaker. In isolation, this pacemaker basically does the same as when the full STG is intact. Um, and uh, with this isolated pacemaker, he started to increase, to decrease uh, the pH of the saline solution he was keeping the, uh, the circuit in. So he's increasing acidity and uh, by these experiments, we can see two almost contradictory, uh, um, we can make two almost contradictory observations. So first of all, uh, there is a critical value of uh, the pH uh, of the saline solution at which the nominal, beha the nominal behavior crashes. So for instance, these uh, strongly, these strong, beautiful nominal bursting start to become shallower uh, as you uh, increase acidity of the saline solution but the moment, so the transition from the nominal burst to the shallower burst happens at different uh, pH concentration, depending on the animal uh, in which you do the experiment. So this is animal one, animal two, animal three. Uh, they all pass from strong burst to weaker burst, but at very different pH concentration. And the same happens for the transition from this weak burst to tonic sparking and for, for the transition from tonic sparking to, uh, to uh, silent. So the other observation we can make is that despite this quantitative variability, all neurons, so all um, instances of the circuit undergo the same qualitative transition uh, in terms of behavioral, uh, behavioral step as you, as, you increase, as you increase the strength of a perturbation, okay? So you have on one side this kind of variable quantitative response uh, to perturbation, but you also have stereotyped universal response to perturbation in terms of the qualitative changes that you observe in the behavior, okay? So you have huge variability of the cellular component and synaptic component of the circuit. This is probably reflected in the different, temp the different perturbation magnitude to each behavior change, but kind of surprisingly, um, the qualitative transition are exactly the same despite uh, this huge variability at the single component level. And the same happens for temperature perturbation. So as you start to increase temperature, you see the transition from the nominal burst to again to a weaker burst, but now the transition is not to tonic sparking, but rather to a slow oscillatory uh, potential with an excitable crest, and then a slow oscillatory potential without uh, the possibility to excite the neuron and eventually uh, silent. Okay, so for temperature again, you have quantitative differences in terms of the critical temperature at which the behavior crashes, but you have the same, exactly, this, the, exactly the same qualitative transition in terms of the observed step of behavior changes in response to, uh, to perturbation. So the question is, how can we explain and understand this uh, variable universal? So I will answer this step by using both control theory and singularity theory. Uh, and the way in which these two theory can be, uh, can be jointly used to say something uh, more insightful about this, this observation. So I will again repeat something that you have already seen in this workshop a few times, that is neurons are multi-time scale in our control systems. Uh, why? Because, well, any neuron can be represented as a plant, which is just the passive part of the membrane in feedback interconnection with an active controller given by the uh, no linear activation kinetics of voltage gated ion channel. So voltage variation uh, leads to state change in the controller, which in turn change the intrinsic conductance to the membrane, which leads to further change in the, in the membrane potential and so on and so forth. And this control system is not that easy to be studied when you look at it from, uh, as, a, as, a, as an input output relation from current to voltage, because here you have, because this no linear feedback loop uh, leads to oscillation and bifurcation uh, Etc. However, um, this controller in particular, so the, the complicated part of this feedback loop, which is the controller, uh, is actually uh, quite easy to be studied when you invert the input output relationship of the neuron. So when you look at the neuron from voltage uh, to uh, from voltage to current, um, that is when you use a voltage clamp instead of a current clamp experiment. 
And so when you do this, as Hodge and Huxley first observed, you realize that the control there is actually quite easy because it's just the parallel interconnection uh, of uh, conductive branches with some biases given by the energy potential, some uh, low pass filter given by the activation kinetics or inactivation kinetics, and some no linearity uh, due to the uh, saturation of ion channel activation. Um, and the simplicity of this controller, I think it's reflected quite nicely in the simplicity of the voltage clamp response of basically any neuron. And in particular, if you take a spiking neuron, you realize that independently of the, the underlying current, I'm using the, the Oshkenazi model here just for just as an illustration, but independently of the underlying current, you always have first the fast activation of some regenerative current, in this case, the activation of sodium current, and then the slow activation of some restorative current, like uh, the delay rectifier potassium, and the slow inactivation of uh, the, sodium, the sodium current. And when you look at these two uh, steps, these two temporal steps in the voltage clamp from a control theoretical perspective, uh, these two steps corresponds the first one to the engagement, the activation of a fast positive feedback loop, and the second step to the engagement of a slow negative feedback loop. And uh, in a very simplistic but uh, insightful because generalizable way, one realizes the spike is just the conjunction of fast positive feedback and slow negative feedback. Why is this generalizable? Well, because if you take a slightly more complicated spiking behavior like bursting, and as we saw yesterday in uh, uh, Stefano Panzeri's talk, it's really crucial to be able to modulate the spiking behavior because the same amount of spike liberated in tonic spiking or in a bursting pattern can lead to completely different information about the behavior of an animal or about the uh, sensed uh, the sensed stimulus or about the relevance of the sensed stimulus for the task that the animal is doing. So being able to modulate the spiking pattern uh, is crucial to be able to have uh, a biologically uh, inspired way of codifying stimuli and decoding them. So if you take the voltage clamp response uh, of a bursting neuron, basically you find the same as a spiking neuron, but repeated on two uh, extra time scale. So in this case, in this model, you have the fast activation of sodium, the slow activation of potassium, the slow activation of calcium, and the ultra slow activation of calcium activated potassium. And this four ingredient corresponds basically to the same feedback motive of spike, but repeated uh, twice, because basically you have these uh, fast mixed uh, feedback controller responsible for spike with the fast positive feedback and slow negative feedback. And then you have a slow mixed feedback controller with the slow positive feedback and the ultra slow negative feedback. And when you put the two together, you get exactly the voltage clamp response uh, of a bursting neuron. So uh, when you look at bursting from a feedback perspective, everything becomes as simple as spike, I think, because you just have uh, the activation of the slow positive feedback for the burst upstroke, then the alternation of fast positive, slow negative, fast positive, slow negative for all the train of spike um, inside the burst, and then an ultra slow negative feedback loop that uh, end the burst. And uh, as you tune this relative, the relative strength of this feedback loop, you can tune and modulate the spiking behavior in a very flexible and robust way. So uh, how can we make all of these slightly more quantitative to try to understand uh, what uh, Eve Mar is observing in an experiment. So to make this extra step, I will use concept from singularity theory, in particular the concept of organizing center as uh, used and defined by uh, Marty Kulbitsky and collaborators since, uh, since the 80s. Um, so all this feedback story about neuronal excitability that I just told you can be rephrased and kind of visualized in terms of uh, uh, IV, IV curve shape. And in particular, we consider IV curve in the three characteristic, three uh, a basic time scale of neuronal behavior that is the fast time scale, the slow time scale, and the ultra slow time scale. So, spike generation, spike, uh, inter spike period, and burst generation and uh, inter burst period corresponding to the three time scale. And uh, since I'm not interested in adding even more time scale to this model, I will just uh, assume that the ultra slow uh, IV curve is uh, monotonically increasing. So just ultra slow positive conductance that is purely ultra slow negative feedback, no positive feedback in the uh, ultra slow time scale. 
And so now we can just look at how the fast and the slow behavior can be uh, shaped relative uh, to each other. And uh, there can be many configurations, but for sure we have these four basic configurations that can be, uh, that we can imagine are relevant to understand modulation of spiking behavior. Uh, why? Because one, when both fast and slow behavior curve are monotone, uh, then you have no fast, neither slow uh, negative conductance, and this corresponds to a passive uh, response uh, from the neuron. Then when the fast IV curve is cubic, then you have uh, this region of fast negative conductance that corresponds to uh, this fast positive feedback, whereas the slow negative conductance is still monotone and this corresponds to uh, tonic spiking. Then you have kind of the opposite configuration in which the fast, the fast IV curve is monotone increasing, so no fast positive feedback, but you have a region of slow negative feedback, and this corresponds to slow oscillatory, the generation of slow oscillatory potential. And then when both IV curve are uh, cubic, when you have both uh, a fast and a slow region of negative conductance, then the interaction between these two positive feedback loop leads to, uh, leads to bursting. So to understand this scheme from a singularity theory perspective, the question that one uh, asks is, what's the organizing center of these four configurations? That is, what's the least degenerate uh, configuration of fastest low IV curve, such that under infinitesimal perturbation of this degenerate configuration, I can reproduce uh, the four uh, configuration I'm showing here. And it's intuitive to uh, imagine that this degenerate situation correspond when both the fast and the slow IV curve have a, uh, an inflection point exactly for the same value of the membrane potential. And now we would like to find a normal form for this degenerate situation that is a form that not only capture this degenerate situation, but also that satisfy the constraint that under infinitesimal perturbation can reproduce all these four uh, configuration and maybe more. And uh, after a little bit of singularity theory, uh, one, can, one can find this solution for the expression of the fast IV curve and the slow uh, IV curve. And this solution is unique modulo strong equivalence, that is modulo diffeomorphism in the space of parameter and the space of variables. Um, and this normal form, it's, it is a normal form. We are not really interested in a specific uh, form, but uh, what we can for sure see in this normal form is that we, we have this parameter beta s, that it's the tuner of the fast negative conductance. Then we have this parameter beta s, which is the tuner of the slow uh, negative conductance. And then this parameter gamma, which basically tune the interaction between the fast and the slow negative conductance. So given this normal form, we can use a little bit of uh, algebra to compute this parameter chart, which partition the parameter space of uh, this normal form in open uh, regions, each corresponding to a qualitatively different uh, IV curve, fast and slow IV curve configuration. And uh, as a consequence, each qualitatively different IV curve configuration co corresponds to a qualitatively, di qualitatively different uh, spiking, uh, spiking pattern. So the importance of having passed through singularity theory and having, and having built this normal form uh, formally, it's that uh, singularity theory, it's a model independent theory. What does this mean? It means that this parameter chart is not specific to the normal form I just, uh, I just showed you, uh, but on the contrary, it will be shared by any uh, model, both finite or infinite dimensional, like an actual experimental system that satisfies the same modeling assumption that we are using here. So if you assume that neural dynamics is uh, completely determined by the IV curve configuration, then necessarily this parameter chart we characterize uh, any neural system that satisfies this condition. And so this means that this parameter chart is naturally suited, even though it's a polynomial normal form, it's very, it's very simple. There are not even conductances in this normal form. Still, this parameter chart can naturally be used to uh, explain and understand experimental, experimental observation. Again, under the assumption that the neuron we're modeling, we're, we're measuring, uh, can be uh, understood in terms of a bigger configuration. And I think this is something that's accepted since uh, basically uh, Hodgkin Huxley. So um, what are these universal perturbation paths? So when I 
when I first thought, so when Tim uh, contacted me about this paper, it was because they were on the verge, basically, of being rejected from by physical journal because one of the reviewer was really unhappy that there, were, there was no modeling inside inside this paper, and so Tim sent me this uh, this figure, and right at the same time, I was working on this uh, on this parameter chart for the book project that we are working on with Rodolfo and Guillaume. And so when I look at this figure, I, when, I, when I look at the figure that Tim sent me, I realized that I was looking basically at the same figure in the parameter chart I was creating. Why? Because the transition that we see in response to temperature are exactly the transition that are enforced by the topological structure of this parameter chart. Indeed, if you want to pass from uh, bursting to slow oscillatory potential, necessarily you have to pass from region D, which corresponds to oscillatory potential with an excitable uh, crest. For the uh, for the spike, and uh, similarly, the same happen is happening for pH. So, for instance, if you want to pass from bursting to silence, necessarily you have to pass through tonic spiking. Okay. So, at least if you are modulating your neuron in a bio in a something that makes sense biologically, then the transition from burst to silence necessarily pass through uh, tonic spiking. Or when you also have a path here that passed through slow slurry potential and then silence, okay? So these two perturbation paths that uh, Jacob was observing in experiment were actually the same path that one would find in uh, the parameter chart I was building from a purely abstract viewpoint for the, uh, for the book project. Um, so how can we interpret this? And then I will pass to the relevance of this for neuromorphic engineering. So, the, the way we interpret this is that any neural system basically shares share the same low dimensional uh, the same low dimensional geometry, and this low dimensional geometry has not been built by taking a, a specific conductance based model and reducing it and find some normal form, which is the standard way in which um, a differential equation approach to uh, to neural system would uh, would lead. Here, we build this normal form and this parameter chart starting from input-output relationship. And that is why the assumptions we make are empirical assumptions, they're not mathematical assumptions. And that is why it's reasonable to, to, uh, to arrive at the conclusion that this low-dimensional geometry shared basically by any, uh, by any neuronal system. And uh, um, so how does variability, for instance, in the critical uh, in the critical threshold. So I can imagine that all neurons under pH perturbation follow this path. So how it's possible that they cross this, uh, they cross these lines, this variety, this transition variety of different pH? Well, they can, they can either start from different point here, but also it's reasonable to imagine that the smooth embedding from this low dimensional representation to the possibly infinite dimensional representation uh, of an actual neuron spiking in experiment uh, that is what's creating the variability, okay? So uh, because the, the embedding from low dimension to high dimension is smooth, you cannot change the way, you cannot change the topology of this parameter chart. You cannot change the way in which this transition, this transition variety intersect. And that is why in an experiment, you will never see a bursting neuron that first converge to silence and then converge to some sparking. You will, you will always, always observe bursting to tonic spiking to, uh, to silence. Um, so that is why I like to call these uh, universal perturbation paths, uh, because they're kind of shared by any neuronal system satisfying the assumption, the empirical assumption that IV curve configuration determines, uh, determines the spiking behavior. So why is this relevant for neuromorphic engineering? Well, because this observation that any system that exhibit biologically re relevant neuronal behavior is organized by this, by this same low dimensional geometry is not true only for biological neurons. This must be true also for uh, neuromorphic systems, at least if you want our neuromorphic systems to behave like actual biological neurons. And as you can see, as, as you saw, you don't need to put complicated conductance-based model to achieve this. Any normal form or any simplified circuit that satisfies the same input-output relationship as uh, um, as a conductance-based model in terms of IV curve modulation, will satisfy this constraint and will biologically and will behave like a biological neuron, both in terms of intrinsic behavior and in terms of uh, response to uh, to disturbances. 
or any kind of elite for that matter. Um, so there is a way, uh, there are quantitative ways to map any circuit parameters satisfying this assumption to this low dimensional geometry. And one of them is this dynamic input conductance theory that we introduced in this in Iron, uh, paper in 2015. Um, and I will give a short, um, a short tutorial in the NMC, uh, NMC channel, uh, I think at, uh, in a half an hour, maybe after the talk, we have kind of a short tutorial about how to use um, DIC theory in the specific setting uh, of conductance-based models and for uh, the Neurodin chip uh, that we are using uh, in our topic. Um, and given this map, one can uh, kind of critically for, uh, for neuromorphic engineer, one can identify sensitive corresponding to modulation and insensitive corresponding to robustness direction in this uh, possibly very high dimensional parameter space uh, determining the behavior of your experimental system. Um, and uh, this might be crucial to uh, do basically what um, Eve did for conductance-based model, that is to try to find, uh, trying to uh, build in a constructing fashion, trying to find a kind of a sweet spot, which would be a sweet subspace actually, it won't be a single point because of degeneracy, because of variability, we expect like a huge subspace of parameter uh, that ensure robustness with respect to unavoidable perturbation. And okay, for the STG neurons, these unavoidable, unavoidable, unavoidable perturbation are pH variation or temperature variation, whereas for neuromorphic uh, system, uh, unavoidable perturbation for sure are transistor mismatches. And the discussion we were having yesterday on the NMC channel uh, suggests that there might be a, like a beautiful uh, analogy, a beautiful parallel between how neurons are able to um, uh, be robust, so neural circuits are able to be robust, robust to uh, temperature perturbation by suitably tuning the Q tens uh, of their uh, of their kinetics and their conductances, and uh, the way in which we might be able to uh, to tune um, uh, transistor in such a way that despite transistor mismatches, the model will uh, remain uh, will remain robust without the needs of measuring or fitting the parameter in any, uh, in any precise fashion. So um, yeah, this ends my presentation and thanks, thanks for the attention and I will uh, take questions if, uh, if there are. Thank you, Alessio. Um, I don't have access to the chat. I'm afraid that I don't know whether there is any question in the audience. I will before. check. Um, I don't think so, doesn't seem so. So any reason why um, temperature creates one path and pH creates the other path in your... Um, so they, they mess up with the channel kinetics in a different fashion. So temperature mess up with the conductances and channel kinetics through the Q-tens and uh, for sure there is an equivalent of the Q-tens by respect to pH. So the way in which uh, channel kinetics are tuned to respond to, um, to pH, and these, uh, these are the Q-tens of pH, is different with uh, respect to, uh, to the Q-tens of temperature. And uh, I think that from a physical perspective, this is just because uh, temperature modulates uh, this quanta, this quantum system in a different way as, uh, as compared to pH. Mm -hmm. um, what, what we really like is that these two paths are kind of orthogonal. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they really, uh, I think that this is something that's, that's discussed in the paper, the fact that these two perturbations are not redundant uh, is probably something that evolution leads the circuit to, to converge to um, in such a way that these two orthogonal paths works basically as sensors of uh, temperature changes and, and pH changes. So if from bursting you crash toward SOP, this means that what's changing is the temperature and not the pH. Whereas if you, um, uh, if you crash from bursting to tonic spiking, this basically is a, 
uh, wake up call that uh, pH is say, changing and not uh, and not temperature. So that's um, we think there is kind of a, a utility for the two paths to perturb the system in a uh, almost or orthogonal way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think we need probably to move to the next talk. Um, Thanks, Rodolf. Very good. So, um, and, and so Fred Brocar now uh, gives me my lab here, um, uh, and at the Institute of Neuroquotation uh, here at UCSD, will now give the complement of, of what LSU talked about uh, from the neuromorphic uh, engineering perspective. So, in fact, uh, Fred has been trained as a neuroscientist. He's, in fact, has been recording from, from neurons in, in uh, uh, both intracellular and extracellularly in vitro. Uh, but then over the last uh, five, six years, so he has really um, uh, dived into uh, neuromorphic uh, neural interfaces, basically coupling uh, silicon uh, models of, of neural computation um, and, um, and neurodynamics uh, with, with, uh, with biology um, in a physical way. Um, and, and so he'll be telling us about um, basically the, the complement of what uh, Alessio just talked about, about this um, um, voltage clamping right, techniques that say Hodge actually used. In fact, now you can turn it around and have uh, the circuits themselves implement dynamic clamps. In fact, the synapse can be thought of as a dynamic clamp. And so there's great opportunities here uh, to, to then interface with, with biology, but also in this project, right? So interfacing between the hardware and the software and, uh, and harnessing that to, to uh, um, get at controllable dynamics uh, is, is, is a very important uh, one. So, so, so Fred, yeah, give it away. All right, thanks. Uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay. So yeah, indeed, uh, it's very uh, complimentary of what uh, Alessio has been presenting. So I'm working at the uh, INC uh, in San Diego. And um, one of the classical um, view of like Telluride or like in many uh, of the logos and t-shirts is this idea of uh, having a, uh, a part of neuromorphic engineering and neuroscience that interact with each other uh, in, in closed loop. And, and so far, like since the beginning, uh, neuromorphic engineering has been inspired by neuroscience. And here I would like to talk a little bit more about how like actually like some of the <clears throat> neuromorphic engineering tools and chips um, can be actually used to help um, uh, investigate like more uh, serious uh, phenomenon in neuroscience to just having a chip, but uh, interacting with uh, biological neurons and, and silicon neurons. Uh, so uh, since the beginning, uh, like the, the realization of this uh, isomorphism by uh, between the, the charge carriers in, uh, in biology and in, uh, in, uh, in transistors in, uh, in subcrucial regime, like uh, neuromorphic engineering has been producing like uh, a lot of chips like at different scales, um, different size. Uh, that match uh, what we uh, in neuroscience have been uh, investigating. Uh, so from like intracellular recording like of single neurons, we have like a, a lot of plethora of uh, models of single neurons in neuromorphic engineering. Um, we have also like um, neural networks, uh, uh, implementation of large, uh, large scale networks up to maps and like multi-chip systems uh, that incorporate sensors and chips uh, together that could like be the equivalent of a systems in the, in the human brain. Uh, and the interesting thing is like all the systems in normal thing engineering, as you know, like uh, use spikes, uh, even though like in biology, we have like other uh, different kind of signals that are, might be of interest, like some uh, like focal field potentials or uh, um, some effective eff effects uh, in the brain, like in a, <clears throat> at the higher scales. <clears throat> but like normal thing engineering has been using mostly spikes. And uh, <clears throat> there is a way that we could maybe like, as we have been, uh, Looking at those those spikes, like connecting, because everyone is using spikes, like in, in the biology side and in the, the neuromorphic side, there should be like a way, like pretty straightforward way of connecting like uh, both of those systems together. Um, and so we have like different levels in uh, of recordings that we could uh, obtain in our science. Uh, so we have like single cells, like with the the glass uh, pipettes, or we can have like. Um, at the network size from like those multi electrode arrays and here you have also like nanowire arrays that uh, is like uh, making contact with single cells like any of those uh, needles here um, and we have the equivalent like i was saying uh, so in the normal fixed side we can do like single neurons or networks and uh, so the way of connecting those two will uh, has been like 
study like since the 90s actually like uh, right at the beginning of uh, the implementation of neuromorphic engineering um, and one of the first actually implementation of those uh, interface between biological neurons and uh, transistors uh, has been like with uh, the group from Peter from Hertz in Germany uh, that make um, an electrical synapse actually between uh, some leech neuron um, from uh, Ritius cells from the leech neuron that were grown, uh, as you can see here, like on, a, on an array of field effect transistors. So that's from this paper, like from 96. Uh, later on, uh, he has been growing like snail neurons. So keeping with invertebrate preparations uh, also on uh, field effect transistors arrays uh, that was published in, in PNAS in 2001. So that was early, uh, end of 90s, early 2000s. Um, people have been studying doing those interface. In that case, it was mostly to study the the interface between actually the junction between the the neuron and the, the transistors and see like uh, what kind of uh, possible interaction where uh, we could do at that time. Um, a little bit uh, at the more or less at the same time in the ninety in the mid nineties, um, there was this uh, idea of making um, an artificial synapse between biological neurons and a model uh, of a neuron. Um, back in the days, like in the 90s, computer was very slow, very slower, right, than what we have now. So people were considering the option of making uh, actually the model in hardware to uh, be sure that uh, the system was functioning in real time and that there was no delay. So depending on the complexity of the models, there was this always this open option of making your model in hardware. Nowadays, you can run like a simple, a simple model uh, of like just one conductances on the dynamic clamp uh, in software, like, uh, and you can run, uh, run that on real time. Um, so just to briefly summarize, like the dynamic clamp take like uh, from like a, 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 a pipette, like an electrodes, a single intracellular recording, take the voltage of the biological neurons and use that voltage to compute uh, a currents or like uh, the synaptic currents that is going to be re-injected through the same electrodes into the neuron. So what you can effectively achieve with that system is you can actually like uh, add or subtract any conductance that you want uh, in the neuron based on the voltage that you are recording. So that's a very powerful tool because in a way you are like avoiding like the use of chemicals and you can modify like specific uh, individual conductances and observe like the effect of those modification in real time on the network activity. So initially people have been using like invertebrate systems uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that the the neurons are a little bit bigger, so it's easier to patch those electrodes, but also like because the systems are a little bit simpler and uh, more uh, well understood. So there is uh, uh, a lot more of experiments that uh, could be carried on. Um, so here you can see like it's like a, from uh, a paper from 95 from Lomasson and uh, the group of uh, Gwendal uh, Lomasson and, and his wife at the time, uh, where they have been uh, replacing either the presynaptic or postsynaptic neuron with a model. So here you have like a postsynaptic neuron and they have like a, an inhibitory conductance and you can uh, see like the, the real neuron when there is a spike, you can see like the hyperpolarization of the, the postsynaptic neurons. Uh, and they have been also uh, looking at uh, bursting uh, because one of the main systems they've been working on was the STG uh, pyloric networks of, the, of crustaceans. Uh, so like looking at the uh, small networks and dissecting every single conductances of those neurons to look at the influence of like those different conductances on the bursting rhythms and also like on the, the of, of each neuron, of the bursting of each neurons and the general uh, rhythms of the network itself. Uh, so that's like a very uh, powerful technique that was uh, starting to be used. And uh, later on, uh, they have been pushing the limit of the techniques by uh, using uh, this technique in uh, in uh, in vitro with uh, slices from the ferret, visual uh, cortex of the, the ferrets, uh, uh, sorry, the thalamus of the ferrets. Um, so here you the TC is the thalamocortical cells, uh, and so the main the same principles. You were using uh, one single electrode to uh, record the voltage um, and um, mimic like uh, <coughs> GABA synapses. Here you have a schematic representation of the systems. Um, and what is amazing in that work, they were using two different kind of uh, 
patch clamp. So there is uh, first there is like a two different synapses, sorry, artificial synapses. So there is like one synapses that's made from like a, an hardware uh, neuron. So this is like a silicon uh, model retinal cell uh, on a chip that was providing the input to the stratocortical uh, neurons. As you can see here, like the those cells like have uh, inputs from uh, retinal ganglion cells that are like severed during the the preparation. So you can reestablish those connection by having uh, a, a hardware cells in hard, hard, hardware neuron on that side, and they were doing the patch clamp with like a, the model neuron in that uh, in that one was um, implemented on software on a computer, um, and they were able to modify the chain, the the, the strengths, the, the conductance of this uh, GABA synapse here, and uh, the goal of the experiment was just to look at the spike transfer uh, between the court, uh, the, the the retina to the the, the thalamus. Um, and the, by changing the different conductances, that um, is something very difficult to do, like um, experimentally without this uh, dynamic clamp uh, setup. Uh, they were looking at the different activity of the, the thalamocortical cells and how like the spikes of the thalamocortical cells were correlated with the one from the retinal cells. Um, I'm not just going to just going to pass those results. It's just to give you an, uh, an overview of like what kind of experiments are, are possible with those kind of things, um, those kind of setup with the single cell uh, recording and silicon neurons uh, with the dynamic clamp. At the network level, so like when we're like going past like single neurons, uh, people have been looking at um, uh, extracellular signals because in those cases, especially in the in the ganglions of some uh, in invertebrates and uh, invertebrates, so the lampreys, like a small uh, um, vertebrate, like the simple vertebrate systems uh, that people have been uh, looking at. Um, and they use in that case, like uh, extracellular electrodes uh, to get the signals from like the root, ventral root, um, that provide input to uh, a CPG that has been implemented on a, also neuromorphic hardware. And from there, they are getting um, the stimulator that will uh, just make a closed loop system between the external, uh, the ganglion of the, <coughs> the lamprey and the CPG is implemented in a, in a, a VLSI uh, hardware. Uh, so that was a simple experiment just to look at the, the coupling if it was unidirectional. So they were just like uh, looking at if there was only like a one way, one -way uh, communication or like bilateral communication in closed loop systems. So that was very uh, experimental and just to, to make uh, the proof of concept that uh, those systems could be coupled at the network level, even if those neurons are like uh, those small networks have like very few no, small number of neurons it's still like a, a, a previous a, a better implementation than just like a single neuron so we have like a, a more complex uh, neuron uh, neuromorphic models and this has been done again uh, um, in 2016 like on uh, FPGA this time uh, also the same uh, system uh, in that case they are like using uh, bilateral um, like a CPG is a little bit more complicated. So the cast like two, um, that represent the two sides of the, the animal. And this was done in, in rat. So in that case, they were recording from the spinal cord, like at different, uh, four different locations. And that was providing the input um, to the artificial CPGs that was used to control um, um, intra uh, spinal stimulator. So in that case, I was not completely closed loop, but that's uh, the, just a proof of concept that you can just use like a, a CPG in neuromorphic hardware that would take input from a, from a, from the system and could provide the output that were looking exactly like the, the one in a, in vivo uh, recording. Um, and they are like now working on doing closing the, the loop. So they, they have been uh, using that systems to make a, a closed system for a rehabilitation for like gate uh, in a, in the rat that has uh, the spinal cord, which is severed. So in that case, they're like just bypassing the, the lesions in the spinal cord by using the, the recording uh, from like uh, upstreams um, to uh, feed uh, a model that will uh, just uh, provide the stimulation downstreams of the lesion. So that's like a, kind of like a bridge over the lesions uh, through like a neuromorphic system. Um, so um, the, in all those systems, like even though like that's a very impressive work, um, they are using mostly a very uh, small number of synapses. So I would like to um, just talk a little bit more about uh, biology. Yeah, Fred, you have, you have five minutes. I'm hoping you can get to your dynamical synapses with Nerd and um, So there is like a, a large number of um, 
synapses, uh, different types of neurons, uh, different types of neurotransmitters, but even within a single class, so that's the kind of different type of neurotransmitters, uh, within a single class there is of neurotransmitter, there is different type of receptors that have like each of them as a different subunit composition and each subunit is like a, as different um, um, forms uh, due to uh, alternative splicing uh, at the gene level. So just pass that if we can go through later. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of just at the surface of the synapses. So even though there is all this variability that is present for every kind of um, different uh, type of neurotransmitters, like even the, the postsynaptic densities uh, and the location of those uh, receptors also like varies from neurons to neurons. And so there is, on top of that, there is also like a glial uh, coverage. So what I'm getting through is that there is this concept that um, actually pretty much uh, every synapse is unique. Uh, like people have been advancing this idea just based on the biochemical compositions and just uh, the different proteins uh, composing the, the synapses, uh, perhaps not in terms of functional. So um, the, why is this uh, heterogeneity like uh, important? So like at the single neuron level, we have been like talking this week about the different uh, time scales that those things act, uh, like the different forms of plasticity that can be uh, um, created, like that are like uh, arising from those different parameters. Uh, and at the network level, people have been doing modeling work. So like the various like uh, arguments that uh, that's increased the coding efficiencies, uh, computational efficiency that by reducing the cost of computations, and can also like make like information uh, transfer more uh, reliable and more robust. <coughs> and so we to try to tackle this lack of diversity in uh, some of the current neuromorphic system. We've been trying to implement other kind of like the, the of transmitters like uh, the, the the synapses that are present in biology that. Uh, are usually like uh, not very uh, a little bit underlooked in uh, in neuromorphic engineering. So they have like different uh, type of GABA uh, receptors, also like from the glycines, uh, like in an in a main inhibitor uh, in the spinal cord. That um, we don't really have like much uh, neuromorphic implementations on those things. Um, and uh, the idea will be to have a silicon neurons that will be uh, connected to do like dynamic clamp at like uh, parallel uh, levels by using those nanowire arrays. Uh, so we can address every single uh, contact of those nanowire array that make with the neurons could be independently uh, modulated uh, with a silicon uh, neurons on the other side in a normal fig chip that could address like, uh, like every single currents could be implemented uh, on, on different uh, of those um, uh, single electrodes. And so the, the, my, the, the things that I would like to, to address here is like, I think we need more uh, complexity and more diversity of synapses and components in neuromorphic systems. And uh, as um, some of the normal people have been proposing before we can uh, the transistors mismatch kind of provide already like some source of uh, variability among the different neurons uh, and i want i would like to ask like the the, the participants this year like, uh, if that's the only mechanisms that uh, we can use or uh, if we maybe need something else and in the light of the talks about temperature modulation i was wondering perhaps if we could have dynamic temperature modulation of the chip to actually like uh, influence the transistor mismatch uh, in real time that could provide some kind of source of uh, variability uh, in the chip uh, like um, in, a, in, in a dynamic ways. Uh. And so like, uh, as we have been uh, inspired by the, the neuroscience uh, to have like those constraints in neuromorphic chips in terms of energy consumptions, uh, the size of those chips, uh, and um, maybe there might be like a way of integrating like uh, heterogeneity and diversity of components also as a part of uh, the neuromorphic systems now as uh, some kind of constraints that we should take into account uh, far more seriously that uh, we used to uh, in the past. And so like uh, in the knowledge I would like to thank June and Gert that uh, PhD students in Gert's lab we've been uh, experimenting like for like the different kind of synapses. Uh, and the people at the, the ISNL lab in uh, and also like the this group like with uh, Rodolf uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, we've been like, looking a lot uh, for the past years and uh, an active collaboration that um, gave some of those ideas. So if you have any questions, Gert, I have it. I have it. I have a question. I have a question. 
is more not very technical, but addresses the ethical aspects of uh, Christoph, really please working. Please yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a big goal. Let me just move on my, yeah, my router. Yes. I mean, as we as we proceed to uh, to design these very hybrid uh, systems, you know, what kind of ethical questions should we be asking? You know, where do we put them? What can we put? Are there any well, limits? You very know? interesting questions. I have. A, I'm trying to work on that actually, like uh, with some of the collaborators right now. Uh, I think there is like a lot of things like regarding uh, data integrity that should be like uh, very looked into uh, in terms of. Uh, there are other things to, uh, in terms of um, security of those implants. Um, that is like something that I think uh, Marcello uh, Yenke like has been touching in some of his papers, uh, previous papers about um, security of the systems that needs to be like uh, very like very much increased. Um, that is. Um, the, there are like many issues that those things can be act pretty easily and now like we're talking about like uh, getting into like the brains of people right so there are a lot of things uh, that needs to be addressed even though we're not really uh, now yet at the deployment uh, uh, level of those hybrid systems that might actually like represent some uh, danger i think um, to the society i will say but i think we need to be very much proactive in terms of security of those uh, implants like when they are going to be there especially given that a lot of those systems uh, have many different components from different uh, companies and putting yes. things together and having like a, a robust uh, secure systems uh, is going to be like uh, very difficult i think that's great. I'm glad that you guys are thinking about that because I think that is something that we have to address, you know, and uh, that's great. Yeah, I can I can go back to you uh, later, like. Uh, yeah, please do. We'll communicate offline. Yes. Yeah, that will be very great. Like actually, I'm, I'm very interested by those issues. Actually. So, so, Fred, you you went you went very briefly over that one slide on on dynamic clamp. Uh, um, interfaces or, or, or the synapse modeling. Can you go back there and, and uh, explain so, so what you're doing there? So, so what are the types of... Uh, yeah, uh, like, and I have another slide actually I didn't really show, but um, I wasn't sure about the timing. Uh, let me share again the screen. Uh, sorry. So that's the, the system we had in, in mind, uh, especially regarding um, those uh, small uh, CPGs in invertebrate, um, because those things have only three neurons can be modeled with like a very uh, small number of neurons, which could be actually feeding uh, on, on one neurodin uh, chip. And, and so then the idea will be that every single neuron of, uh, of the chip in neurodin could be coupled with uh, an equivalent uh, um, biological neurons but the nice things i think that we can move beyond the normal um, dynamic clamp will be to actually have uh, integrated in the chip like already a small network itself so we, we can move from having only like a one-to-one -one connection between single neuron and a single conductance and rather having uh, the full network that can interact with like a small other network like or like if you can imagine like in the leech when those are segment or any <laughs> We could have like uh, CPGs in uh, silico that can interact with like uh, CPGs uh, in uh, in biology, in 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 vitro or in vivo. Um, the main restriction, though, is the number of um, the recording electrodes that you can do at uh, simultaneously, like to do like dynamic clamp, uh, is beyond four. Is extremely challenging. So that's why uh, there is a lot of hope into those nanowire arrays when you have like uh, uh, basically like a, a, a highly parallel dynamic clamp systems that can be like potentially built by just connecting, of, I mean, just by connecting every single wire with an equivalent silicone neurons. And given now that we have already those massive uh, large scale systems of silicon neurons that uh, we already have the, the neuromorphic part of those uh, systems. Uh, we need to work on the interface and that's I think what June is doing uh, currently. Um, excuse, sorry. 
uh, and so that's uh, that's one of the the hope like from having uh, in the near future having a, a massively parallel uh, dynamic lamp that we could use uh, many neurons uh, on uh, um, addressing many neurons at the same time and one of the the beautiful things with the nano where you are if you look here like I uh, didn't really go into that uh, that that panel but here like there is like different point of contact and actually it seems that to, to, there, to, there is a potential uh, potentiality of like making several contacts with the same neurons with different electrodes. So you should be able to record for some neurons at least on different parts of the neuron uh, at the same time, which is like something that is going to be uh, extremely difficult to do with like a, a single electrodes like uh, by hand uh, trying to patch like uh, the same neuron at uh, two or three different location at the same time, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely difficult. Um, at, uh, so that's one of the reasons people have been using um, invertebrate neurons, as I was saying, because those neurons tend to be a little bit larger, so that makes the, the experimental part a little bit less difficult, but still it's, uh, it, it's still a very challenging uh, setup. <laughs> So looks like we're, we're out of time now, but are there any other questions for, for Fred? Yeah, I, I actually have one, if I may. Uh, Fred? Uh, yeah. Louder, we can't hear you, Christoph. I can hear him. Okay. Uh, so, so Fred, it doesn't look like you're in San Diego right now. Where are you and what does Telluride have to do with it? And what does GERT have to do with it? Um, I am not in Telluride itself, no, I'm uh, in uh, a little bit higher north uh, in the continent. Uh, <laughs> it has to do like uh, with Telluride uh, with the variability, like I think um, all the talk we had uh, had with the neuromodulatory uh, control group uh, was to just how important like diversity uh, and heterogeneity of components is for biological systems. And uh, I think I was trying to convince people that we need like to integrate more of those um, variability uh, into like neuromorphic systems uh, as much as we can. Um, just for one, one side, like one reason would be to be able to communicate with biological neurons in a more uh, robust way or like more realistic because we are like taking into account this uh, variability rather than trying to simplify it. And uh, on the other side, I think having a neuromorphic system that uh, exhibit variability and heterogeneity uh, will allow us to run like neural network models uh, that are like a little bit more realistic and investigate like, uh, Phenomena that take into account uh, this uh, for computation. And we probably have to wrap it up here. But so, um, so, so clearly, this this uh, interfaces uh, between biology and 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 uh, um, uh, neuromorphic engineering uh, play out at, at, at many levels. So we have some further uh, discussions now. Um, we we'll have to stop here, but we have further discussions. On, uh, at the NMC uh, group. Uh, there's some other parallel sessions now, but uh, so the NMC uh, group will be continu uh, continuing discussion what, uh, what the LSEO, um, uh, in fact, LSEO will have a presentation uh, on, on some of the systematic uh, uh, ways of mapping uh, dynamics onto uh, this, this type of NeuroDem plat platform. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the parallel sessions, and we'll see you later. <laughs> Thank you.